for coming here today to um, watch our presentation. As I mentioned before, and I'll, um, when we wrap up, I'll take you to that date. Next month will be uh, the third Thursday. And Jane Jessica Pinky will be uh, speaking on trying to get her topic. She's been tossing around a couple of different topics, so I'll figure out exactly what she's going to be speaking on. I'm really happy today to have Roger Payne, who is a Cherokee National Treasure um, for Cherokee mask and mask making. I'm very knowledgeable about this portion of our history. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him and let him tell you a little bit about his background um, and how, we, how you became interested in doing this. A little bit of housekeeping to make sure we are filming, so make sure that your phones are on vibrate or off. And then um, there's lunch back there, and so we're going to have to cover again. So, uh, also, the sign-in sheet is going around, so please go ahead and that, I'll go ahead and turn it on to Roger. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Kathy. Uh, my name is Roger Kane. Uh, I should do my crazy thing. Oh, <laughs> she didn't turn her phone off, did she? That so, was Marie Nugent. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, my name is Roger Kane. I was born and raised here in Tahlequah. Uh, I'm half Cherokee. Mm, I've been ripping in the middle of doing art for the past 30, 40 years. I don't know. It's a long time. Been making masks for about 20 years, I guess. Uh, but about... 2006, maybe 2005, Sean and I both were invited to uh, to do a, a you know a live wife show at the Hay Museum in New York City, and uh, they called us and they asked us, to, and of course we were excited, like yeah, let's go. <laughs> it's gonna be cool. We've never been to New York City, you know. It's big. It's big time. So it's like we were all excited about it. But the following week they called us back, and they said, uh, uh, well, we hate to tell you this, but Sean, you're welcome. So Roger, you can't come. And he's like, what? And they said, well, we called the tri your tribe, and they said that masks are not part of the Western Cherokee culture. Uh, so that put me on a, like, what? So I got in grad school, finally, yeah, and I started studying this. One of my first things I started doing is studying uh, Cherokee mask making. The whole idea of uh, mask making stopping at the Trail of Tears is kind of a ridiculous concept, construct that we're trying to construct that you know, may be true, maybe not, but I doubt it. But, but first, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. This is uh, Will West Long. He's my, he's my Cherokee hero. He's, uh, he's, he's right below Sequoia to me because if it wasn't for him, a lot of the stuff that artists and storytellers uh, use today, they use probably 90, 95% of the material he collected for James Mooney. A lot of people don't realize that this guy. Next, next one, please. So Will West Long was a 18-year-old uh, a, uh, boy when there James Mooney first came to Cherokee, North Carolina, and he they negotiated where he worked with James Mooney, and he did all the translations from Cherokee to English for Mooney to be able to publish. So during this time, he had his mom, his mom to rely on. His mom was. Let's see, that man, was it 87, 88? He was 18, so his mom had to be at least 40, 50 years old. So we're going back to some knowledge prior to Trail of Tears time, to the removal time. So this guy, what he's holding there is a buffalo mask. It's not a devil mask, it's a buffalo mask. Uh, Cherokees hunted buffalo. We had, we hunted buffalo. Uh, we have a buffalo dance. And uh, there's, there's a small one right there that Sean is passing around. I've been told it's Will West Long's, but I think it's his. His grandson, Alan Longs. And here's another buffalo mask. We'll, we'll see that one a little bit later on. But when they have horns on, they're buffalo masks. They're not devil masks. They're buffalo masks, okay? That's very, very important. Next, please. So uh, the thing with masks goes back to prehistory, prehistoric times. Uh, the top one, all you got to do low D is, uh, is to put on. When I first started making these masks, my grandpa was alive at the time. And... Uh, he was, it was neat. He was, he was the uh, guard at the Heritage Center for ever since they opened it until the mid-80s. And so I asked him, what's the, what's the Cherokee word for mask? And I mean, if you guys know who George Pumpkin is, he, he, knows, he knew quite a bit of Cherokee. And so well, all he could come up with is to put on for mask to put on. It's like putting on your jeans to put on. So but from the book where, where uh, oh, uh, Speck, I think it's Speck and Broom, interviewed uh, Will West Long, uh, it comes from Will West Long, I got to do la, mask, mask. <coughs> so we don't know. I mean, that's, that's how much we've lost in our knowledge of it, but we do know that it's still there. So, so this is going back to DeBry's uh, 
engraving <laughs> paintings back right to the uh, 1600s. The bride, the guy that painted this, never came to North America. A lot of his, a lot of people see a lot of his paintings all over the place representing prehistoric times. When really, all he did was people that came over came back and talked to him about what they saw, and then he drew it. He made it. If you'll notice, the big thing on this thing is the antlers. A lot of times when we're looking at old pictures, a lot, we're going to be seeing some old pictures in a little bit, is being able to tease out the subtle nuances of what the picture is telling you because some of it's true and some of it's not. And that's what was neat about my grandpa Pumpkin whenever I was asking him when I first discovered this book right here, this James Mooney book, you know, it's, it's called uh, History, Myths, and Ticket Formers of the Cherokee. I said, what, what, is this book true or not? He said, well, it's a book. It has a bunch of stories. They're just stories. Some could be true, some could be not. Great answer. I love that answer. You're neither right nor wrong. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what culture is. Culture is vibrant. We, we live it all the time. It doesn't stay static. It's not static. It's always evolving. So what you look at this thing is you're seeing that these Indians are hunting these deer, but these are European deer. These aren't white-tailed deer from North America. So, okay, that's fine. But you can see they're putting the deer on top of them to put the deer on top of them, so that's their mat. Up until whenever Mo uh, uh, Will West Long was doing this book with Mooney, there was still one mask maker that was known to be able to still skin deer like this and still have the head like that. There was one, one of the mask makers at the time that could do that. Now, we're talking about 1888, and this is 1600 and something, so that's 200 years span of different knowledge system that continued. Continued, right? So that's a big thing right there. Next, please. So here's a prehistoric map. This is a stone mass. This is made from 200 BC to AD 400. We're talking about the Adena period. It's right after native people came out of the archaic period and started making mounds and started uh, developing our own kind of religious ceremony, as you might say. So this is one of, this is a stone mass. That, I mean, it's what, 2,000 years old at least? I'll paint next one, please. Here's another one. It's a, uh, this is a mica. It's a cutout. It's a cutout in mica. Again, we're going back to 14, 1 to 400 AD. There's a mask. That kind of looks like this booger mask right here. I mean, when you look at the side view, so these right here, they always call these bird, ma bird masks, but when you look at the side, you go, hmm, you know, it makes you go, hmm, you know. That's what's cool about doing anthropology. You go, hmm, huh, is that so? I mean, that doesn't seem, you know, that's this. Anthropology just ruins you as a historian because history is all real. All real. <coughs> one, please. And then we have these long nose uh, maskets that they wore on their ears. These were found at Cahokia. And these are about 12 to 14 inches long, so they put outside of the head about this far. And it's cool, it's all copper. There's, there's tons of these kind of masks all over the southeastern United States in this kind of shape right here. The shape right here, and some of them have these long noses, and some of them don't. Might add, this is made out of copper. That's why it has that patina look to it, because it's made out of copper. Uh, if you have any questions, just say so. I'll be glad to talk. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> and let me know if I mumble too. Uh, next, please. This is one of my cool ones right here. So, I started grad school. You know, I'm in there. I'm, I'm studying. I think I wanted to study maths. I wanted to study material culture items. I wasn't sure, but. I found this mask, you know, it's in sun, sun circles and human hands, it's all over the place, and all that stuff, and like, and it's called a buffalo mask. Why is it called a buffalo mask? Why in the world, does that look like a buffalo to you? These kind of masks are made out of, out of shell. They usually have like a little lightning bolt coming down through here, and there's a little circle right, right here, and they sometimes have a dragonfly coming down under here. But they all have this long nose. Is that the long nose god? We don't know. But what's cool about this, this is from the proto-historic time. It's from Tennessee, the Tennessee area, just around Chattanooga, which means more likely it's our ancestors' art that's during the proto-historic. Proto-historic time is right after, or right during the time DeSoto came here and discovered North America, or Columbus discovered South America, okay? So that's what we're talking about proto-historic, is during that time period where we're, we're going from, come on in, come on in. We're, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, it's hard to say, but it's, what, what's yeah. it? Feel free to speak out, Eddie. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we want to discover. We're here, yeah. You know, I'm talking. I'm trying to talk. Well, explain why it's a buffalo mask. Sorry. Well, it turns out, it's like I couldn't see a buffalo in it, but it turns out it was found on Buffalo Creek. 
So that's why it's called the Buffalo Man. Oh, okay. But it's still, it's total historic time. More than likely, uh, Dragging Canoe had a mask like this of some sort. This is also known as a, uh, as uh, they find some of the, in the proto historic time where they put this on top of a dead, dead individual. They're, they're some of them are this, big, this large. Most of them are small six inch sizes. So, so but they find them in burials over in, their face. Yeah, on some of them they do, yeah. Sorry, I did. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> okay. Who, what defines a Cherokee mask? Who in the world defines that? Is it the Cherokee Nation? Is it Eastern Band? Is it Katua? Is it some other tribe, tricky tribe we don't know of? Or non profit we don't know of? We don't know. But who defines this? Who defines what masks and bands are? Who, who defines that? Uh, next one, please. These two defined this in 1888. These guys did. This is Will West Long when he was an elder man. In the, in the 1930s or so there in Cherokee, he's working on a mask, and you see that curve right there, I guarantee you this was a warrior mask, because that looks like a snake, so he's working on that one. He's using chisel and a hammer, so he's sitting out there working on a mask. This is James Mooney. He's the one that made this book right here, but this guy, Will West Long, was the guy that connected all the Cherokees, where it's Swimmer, John X, or I get told, I can't remember, I can't say uh, a little bit his mom's name, whether it was from them or not, but he's the one interpreted it from Cherokee to English, so this guy could get it published. And that's where all this stuff comes from. So a lot of the stories in here could be true, they could be false. Again, they're stories, you read everything with a grain of salt. You know, <coughs> well, that's possible, maybe. But what's cool about it, is that whenever I was growing up, I was hearing stories that were similar that were in this book. But I knew my grandma and grandpa didn't read, my grandma didn't read very well, you know, she, but I loved it, I was her favorite, you know. I, got, I sound like Trump, I was her favorite, you know. But, <laughs> but, you know, so we talked about it and everything. And so it's a story that a bunch of Cherokees gave to this 18 year old when he was 18 years old. He deciphered it and gave it to this one right here. And he's the one that published this book. So a lot of stuff in here is from Cherokee. It's all still written in Cherokee, in, in Cherokee, in the Eastern Band Collection, in uh, the uh, Cherokee the Museum. All this is still in Cherokee, old style Cherokee. So I don't know if they were interested in that one or not. What's so the, the date of the publication? This one came out in 1920 something, maybe 1930. Oh, it was okay. after he had passed. One of them had passed. They yeah. sell this in the gift shop, and they mm -hmm. sell it at the, yeah. at the heritage. Now see how much I use that tore it up, it's twice as wide as my foot. And you tear it up, you know. If you're an artist, you, if you're a Cherokee artist, you have this book, you have this book, and you have this book. These are like your three main ones if you're a Cherokee artist. I mean, you gotta have these guys. You know, it's like, how will they do that? Next one, please. Another one he worked with was, was Frank, thanks for Frank, Frank G. Speck. I must add that both Speck and Mooney both recorded Will West Long, we'll hear him singing here in a little while. Uh, a lot of the song and dance. This, this Frank Speck, is this book right here, with Will West Long's interpretation point, along with his uncle Walter Calhoun, not Walter, but Lawyer Calhoun. Okay, so in collaboration with Will West Long. That's pretty cool. That says that, this book doesn't say that, it didn't acknowledge the Indian talking at all, contribution to it at all. And I can't help it, we usually present together. And that's something that we'd really like to see anytime in academia, anywhere, is when the, in anthropology they're called the informant. In other words, the person who's giving the answers or being interviewed. And normally the Indian isn't ever acknowledged. You know, it's normally the person in academia. Right. So this is one of the first times that was done. And even though this guy Frank Speck, he was kind of a turd, because he talked <laughs> bad about Will West Long. He said he was that, that was old bricks that did oh, that. That was old bricks. Really, he said he was so slow. He takes so long. They wanted to just get it done. They all did. Mooney did. Frank Speck did. And again, these notes are in the Cherokee the Museum. But they're in the American Philosophical Society in the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Frank Speck was at University of Pennsylvania. James Mooney, he was the ethnologist with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so they were thinking the Indians we were all going to die off. We're still here. <laughs> Uh, so they were out there collecting all this data so we could, we could make sure we knew this stuff. Next one, please. So now we're going to look at masks. This is, this is a presentation I did with uh, 
south where Gibson School was about 12 years ago, maybe more. <coughs> But they, they pulled masks out of the collection and gave me a big old long list to teach to class about masks. And so that's what I taught there at Port Gibson School. What he School. did was he worked with students at Port Gibson, Port Gibson School and they live streamed with the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. And they would hold up the mask and students would ask questions about and for Roger to interpret to know what kind of mask they were. If they were dying. And they recorded it. So it was a pretty neat little project they did with the students. You, you mean masks at the Smithsonian? Uh -huh. yes. And you would respond? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So these are pictures of those masks that they would hold up, you know, on oh, the... They did a big screen like this, but it was real students live streaming. It was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. and, at yeah. the time, uh, Port Gibson was like the leading in technology everywhere around here. This was like what we have here. They Port Gibson had this like 15 years ago. <laughs> so that's pretty... They were way ahead of their time. <laughs> this one's neat in that it has ears right here and there. The older masks have ears. Older, the older Cherokee masks always had ears on them for some reason or another. So the next one like that one right here, this is a lady booger. You don't just make fun of white people or other people of color or anything like that. You make fun of everybody at the booger dance. The booger dance is, sec is a secular dance in that it has no religious connections. The last, the last recorded religious connection was from Will West Long's mother who said she saw them using a mask whenever she was a young child, and that was in 88, and she was 80 years old. So, I mean, you do the math, that's 1908. So they, we were using a mask before, as ceremonial before then. But it shifted to a secular thing because, again, these ethnologists, anthropologists were coming in and buying up all the masks so they could keep them in the collections and there was no masks to dance with. That's one theory. And it also, another theory is that that's when it became an art <coughs> form, you know, like to collect masks, like for, you know, commerce, like baskets and things like that. But yeah. before then, they weren't really sold. Right. There's no evidence that they were sold as as a, as a commodity, yeah. Yeah. And the next one, please. Uh, next one, this one was really neat because in the note, is the, it was a baby booger. This thing had baby clothes on it before, but it lost over time. These masks were collected during either, this one was collected either by Speck or Mooney. If it's by Mooney, it was in 88. If it's by Speck, it was in the 30s. So this one had a whole whole baby uh, baby clothes down below this thing. So the baby was part of the booger dance. That's pretty neat. This is a gourd with a leather nose tied on top with chicken feathers. That's not very great. Very nice. This is it. Okay. Uh, this one is, is another one, it's a warrior mask. Anytime you see a snake on top, on top of a Cherokee mask, that's a warrior mask. So this one's done by Alan Long. This is, a, this is, a, this is a Will West Long's grandson. And I like to, I found this in a pawn shop. Yeah, so. But it still had the tag. It still had the tag and everything. And this, this is one that I made, I don't know how many years ago. But this is made out of a uh, royal polonia, which is from Japan that somehow is growing all over the place in the Smoky Mountains because back in the early 19, early 20th century, the packing was the seeds of the royal polonia seed inside packing around those Chinese China dolls that they used to sell. And so now it's sprouting up everywhere. It's great wood to carve with. I, I wish I could get some more. It's an easy, easy wood to carve with. But again, we're looking at ups. So again, the warrior mask. The warrior mask has a snake on its head. Why, why is that so? Uh, one possibility is from the Uktana story. You guys familiar with the Uktana story? About how you know, they tried to kill, they finally got a Shawnee guy that would go kill the Uktana. He was gonna kill, they were gonna kill him, but he said, well, I'll go kill the Uktana if you don't kill me, so. Why don't you talk about that mask up there? When you okay, the so the Uktana was a Cherokee dragon. <laughs> he was terrorizing all the Cherokees. You know, if he, he look at you, he can kill you, he can spit on you, you know, he can do all sorts of stuff to you. But he was terrorizing the Cherokee, so they had to get somebody that would go kill him. So they finally got this one guy to go do it that could do it. Everybody else failed. Because he, he was told how to, where to shoot the lieutenant, behind the seventh rib, the whole seven number thing. And then, so he does it. And uh, one drop of blood fell on his head. This is from the, well, there's a bunch of Utena stories. And so there's one where it drops one drop of blood on his head and the snake grew out of it, so he put it, kept it hit covered all the time. So that's possibly where this one comes from, is from the Battle with the Uktana. Pretty cool stuff if you, you know. But, you know, you just gotta infer that. You have to look at the story and also the mass. And maybe they fit together, maybe, maybe not. But it's still a good story. One thing I like to point out with this one is, this is one of his creations that yeah. he made after the Uktana with the horns, the crystals, so the man on the back. Mm 
And then they have the one on the back right there. Temporary mask. Yeah. Today, but you know, it's still telling a really old story. And the most of the stories come from John Ash. Oh, I think I'll put it back up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next one, please. Uh, this is a uh, medicine mask. It's also known as a buffalo mask. Uh, there's accounts where they use it to scare the uh, to scare the sickness out of somebody. You wear the mask, do your song and dance, and and you uh, you just scare the sickness out of it. That's why it's so scary. With it. But the buffalo, there's buffalo. We ate buffalo. We had buffalo dances. We I mean, all that good stuff. Next one, please. This is a booger mask. <coughs> so whenever uh, Mooney first came to uh, came to Cherokee, North Carolina, to talk about Cherokee culture and collecting stories and stuff, uh, they had all these wood masks. And then so later on, so I was looking at the notes, and then later on, Will West Long had kept a lot of the notes himself. And there's one at the Museum of Cherokee where he talks about booger masks were usually made out of gourds. Hmm, that's pretty cool that they were used made out of gourds. When you think about it, that makes the most sense. I mean, you grow a new gourd every year, you have a new mask every year with a wood mask. You'd have to keep it put up and make sure nobody tore it up or the kids didn't play with it or didn't leave it outside after you get through using it. But the gourd, you'd have a new supply every time. And that, so, and he also talks about the different dyes, like this red right up here. This was some kind of, he's calling it some kind of dye up there. I think it's the poke dye, what they said it was, but I don't know. Because it's the mustache on him, the hair around the nose. What's the point of the booger mask? The booger mask is to make fun of something that is not Cherokee, that does not know how to act correctly. And is that you, what the word booger means? Well, booger comes from an anthropologist, and I meant to put that in here, but I didn't. Comes from an anthropologist, I can't remember his name. It's like a big old long name. But he's the one that came out with the booger. The booger. Booger. It was supposed to be booger, but they turned it into booger. Be booger, because that's all he collected from people in the South was the booger mask. Booger. So turned into a booger mask. So really, the booger mask is a, uh, is a construct from an anthropologist in the 1920s that labeled these kind of masks as booger masks, a booger dance. When they're really, the song is, when Will West Long talks about the, about the booger dance, it's a two can do or mask dance. So the booger thing kind of stuck. It sounds kind of cool. Booger man, boogie man, you know. It's also called a clown. Clown dance, yeah, yeah clown dance. So there's different names for it, but there's still, you, it's not, it's part of a whole repertoire of dances in the wintertime. But now since it's secular, we can dance with it in summertime, wintertime, whenever we want, because we have no, no religious connections to it at all anymore. <coughs> so, next one please. That we know of, yeah. Uh, this, is, this is probably the most well-known mask of all Cherokee masks, is the Hornet mask. It's also considered the meanest mask. And, uh, it's, it's been more well-traveled except from the Smithsonian than the any of the, my mouth is. It's been on loan uh, at more places than any other mask from the Smithsonian. Everybody it's wants so unique. And if you've ever messed with a, with, with a hornet's nest, you'd know how delicate those things are and how mean those hornets are when you get it in the wintertime. But still, even after you harvest your, your hornet's nest, it's very hard to handle. It's very hard to really to make a mask out of a hornet's nest because it just kind of just falls apart on you. But some people can, and look well, yeah, at they did. To me, I always think it was leaves when I look at it. You know, like it was like something all covered with sword or horns. Mm -hmm. Of course, effigy mask. Again, there's a bear mask. There's a bear dance. There's a groundhog mask. There's a groundhog dance. Uh, there's a buffalo mask. There's a buffalo mask uh, dance. There's deer mask as well. Next one, please. Uh, this is a old man booger. This one was done by Will West Long. I know that because he does these cool noses on them. These cool noses. Died. Will West Long was the best mask maker. He his he brought the he brought the meanness out of it. Because a turkey mask is supposed to be ugly and mean looking. And the real pretty ones. Uh, they're, they're, well, I got after when I did this, I did a presentation of a booger mask at the uh, one historical. I can't remember what it was. But I got to meet Ray Fogelson. If you know who Ray Fogelson is, you know that's like that's like getting to meet Albert Einstein of the anthropology. You know, he's from the University of Chicago. He likes to study Cherokees and Southeast Indians. Yeah. He's so. done it all his life. And so I met him. I was talking to him. My advisor uh, introduced me to him, Dr. Sabo, and uh, said, uh, "I'd like for you to meet Ray Fogelson." And I said, "Ray, this is Roger Kane. He's a mask maker." And he said, "Oh, I want to know. Do you make those pretty ones or do you make those ugly ones?" 
I said, well, if people have told me they're ugly and scary looking, he said, then you got it right. It's like, all right. So that's, that's the big thing about turkey mats. They're supposed to be ugly and they're supposed to be mean looking. They're not supposed to be all. Walker Cousins. Yeah, Walker Cousin also told me that, which is Will West Long's nephew. Is that wood? Is it made of wood? This is made of wood. It's made out of uh, buckeye. But I always think it's cool the way they make the noses so huge. <coughs> they had something up with noses. <laughs> It's the hardest part to do is pull the nose out and make it look, make your mask still look good. The nose is the hardest part. Uh, this is a woodchuck hide right here. They lift the fur on the side. They stretch the hide over a log, sort of like this, without the uh, without the log, without a mask covering over it. They stretch it over a log and give that rounded look to it. That's this rounded look right here. And then they attach the leather nose to it and lift the hair on the side, so they made a mask out of the hide. And it just dries hard. That's too cool. Next one, please. Uh, this one is made out of a boot. This middle part right here, if you'll see this, this is the top of a boot right here. That we, whenever we did this presentation, I was able to flip it over. They flip it over so we could see it. And one, and these sides right here, you can see the little rings on the boot that was on there before. On the side right here, where the hair covers it up right there. So it's pretty cool. You can make masks out of anything. Turkey, we always do. It makes like, fun of anything. On this one, they're making fun of old men. Yeah. yeah that's the younger men would wear the older men's masks. Know, everyone made fun of everyone. Yeah, and that's, a, that's the theory of, of some of the behind the booger, booger dance is that or they're making fun of old people. Old men. Because as a youngster, 20 year old, it's like, it's not fair that, that 60, 50, 60, 70 year old man's doing these decisions when I know more than he does. So the, the booger <laughs> dance is kind of like <laughs> the young making fun of the old and getting away with it and all that stuff. So this is one of my favorite ones. It's like, it, this would be weird to wear, wouldn't it? You'd have, uh, you'd have this bouncing on your head and have these bouncing on your head while you're down <laughs> dancing. It'd be pretty cool. So this is made out of cloth. Okay, so those are masks. Those are different kind of mask types from Will West Long's time these with Mooney. These are all the Smithsonian. They were all collected around what time? And that, either 1988, 87, or the 1920s, whenever Speck was there. From Cherokee, North Carolina. The time period is either 1878-87 or the 1930s when these masks that we just looked at were collected. Okay, the next, now we're going to talk about masking. So that's the different types of masks. Now we're going to talk about masks. Masking is where you're Cherokee wearing masks for dancing. He is wearing a bear mask. You can't really tell, but that's a bear mask up there. And so he's all decked out. I don't know if that's Mooney or not. I mean, if that's a West Long or not. I think that's not. West Long. So that's one. Here's another one. And here's one from the Heritage Center. The Heritage Center used to have masks in the uh, in the Heritage Center at one time village. in the ancient village, and that you know we know Sam Mellowbug made them. Uh, so we we trying to find out more about that. I'm sorry, we do this to each other. So that mask we know. When I say we, this whole research and everything else. Do we have masks here in Oklahoma? This one was made by Sam Mellowbug, and that would have been done what in the late or the early 70s. 70s? Uh -huh. So that, this is the first picture evidence we can find in the 70s of when we here in Oklahoma started at least showing masks and wearing them and dancing with them. And so that's part of our culture, which it is, it was. Next one, please. Uh, this is some other boogers, modern ones, where we're, where, uh, <laughs> where we're playing with uh, boogers. Yeah, it's heavy road. Yeah, and we're going to art market here. We're going to art market. We're going to go sell our art, and that's what we're doing. And that's over by NSU. So yeah. they're walking right across NSU with that walk-in. Yeah. So that's, this is a modern, modern one right here. So, so these are masks. Troy Boney, Joseph Herb, and my son Jamil at the end there. So these are individual. This is a masker, this is a masker, and that's a masker. Okay, that's where they got all the regalia on there ready to do the masking. Okay, next one, please. So here we're going to talk about masking, the art of dancing with masks. This was taken in the 1930s with a, with Speck. I don't know which one. This is Lawyer Calhoun. I don't know which one of these would be a Will West Long. And here they are with their mask on. Hey, this some is of the, North Carolina. This is North Carolina, yeah. And if you look at some of these masks, they are in the collections of the Smithsonian. So the Smithsonian bought them. I think like $5 a piece back then. Maybe, it, it was $3, $5 if it was dyed. $3 natural, $5 if it had dye on it. That was Will West Long's thing. And here's, here's one I hear. Oh, okay, go back, please. 
Okay, this this song, who's singing this is Will West Long. It was recorded by Franz O. Brooks in 1928 or 29. That's the scratching noise. Is the wax cylinder going round and round and round? It's not shell shakers. This is Franz Elbert's talking from Germany. It's all right. I think I can move it here. school project. He's like, all right, yeah, I still get to use that. So that was that was Will West Long singing this song in the 1928, somewhere in there. He, uh, that was about, the recording was done by Franz Oberts on a wax cylinder. Uh, James Speck did the same thing, except his his stuff didn't make it through. Uh, Franz Oberts, his stuff made it through to the American Philosophical Society. Speck's recordings were on a, was on a special recording that his son made, recorded his son made for him. And uh, those didn't make it. And those were at the University of Pennsylvania, or at Penn, you know. So, uh, so those didn't make it, did we were lucky that this, this report didn't make it somehow. So next one we have is a booger dance that we did in 2012 at the Hard Rock. And it was the first booger dance that we know of that's on tribal land since we got our sovereignty back or since we lost our sovereignty in 1907. Because we have to remember the Heritage Center is not tribal land. You know, that's private. So, yeah. so the next one is a, is, a, is about the same way, but it's Corey Steele's one that's singing. He has a beautiful voice. Next one, please. So you'll notice in this, you have what's called a driver, and that's the guy who's the straight man, and that'll be Corey Steele. And the boogers are just all over the place, not acting right. So. <laughs> <coughs> and this is at um, the October <laughs> Art Market at the Hard Rock Center.
as a, as Quayfield senior, he's he's, he's a uh, PhD student, graduate student at OU right now. So he's he's been a good one. He's a, he's a good he's a great driver. Next one, please. Okay, so what was going on? Oh, it changed my font. I had different fonts on it. Oh well. <laughs> uh, so while this book was going on in 1887, these. While, while it was being written, compiled by these two guys right here, here Will Westbound here is an older adult. He is 18 years old. He's working with James Mooney at the time to make this book. So a lot of people like, he came here to Tahlequah. He was here in Tahlequah in, in 1890 to study the Cherokees here in Oklahoma, just like he did in the Eastern Band. So while he was here, and then Christie was, was out wild and everybody was all scared of him. Turned out he was right, you know. But, but in hindsight, it's 2020, but he was right about the, about the Dawes Row and about the Curtis Act. See, at the time this book was being compiled, this Curtis Act, I think, was in effect. So it was against the law for them to dance like this, and this whenever they came out. It was against the law. The federal government made it, made it against the law for Indians to gather made it against the law for Indians to practice their own uh, ceremonies. So that's what the Curtis Act did. That knocked us out. This one made us all have to get our own piece of land and be like the rest of civilization. So while that was happening, this stuff happened when he came to Tahlequah. So he's in Tahlequah, sitting in his motel room, thinking, do I get out there and get shot in these crazy woods right here around these crazy Cherokees? <laughs> or do I go up there and I see where there's a bunch of dead Indians up there? And he did. He went up to Wounded Knee. And what he did after that is just extraordinary. Because if it wasn't for this man, he worked with the, the Kiowa and Kiowa, and I can't remember who else <laughs> in the he worked with, uh, uh, Quan Parker and him. So he helped to establish the Native American church. If it wasn't for this guy helping write it up for the Native American church, we may not have it, the Native American church, but he's the one that helped do that. Because he went and he started studying these guys. And so it's pretty cool that he, he, was, a, he was known as an Indian lover. And a lot of them back then didn't like it. You know, he was Irish. Good day to have it, because he was Irish. He was Irish. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it, he was able to get it recognized by, as a religion, actual religion. Right. By, I mean, because if you register now with the, with the sex or whatever, right. card carrying, whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this guy, we, we have to thank him for, along with the other He's Native ancestors. White guy, and I do that always. That wrote it all down and helped the Indians do it. Yeah. You know, so. So that's. Yeah. yeah. So well, that's. I have a question real quick about naming. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about stuff that's being said to him. Sometimes maybe wasn't accurate. Of course. So what is your What is your take on naming and, and what the Cherokee? Well, that's. East well, that's a, uh, yeah, oh yeah, there's all sorts of stories. So repeat that question. Yeah, there's all sorts of stories. Her question is, is, what, is it, do I think that possibly the Cherokees telling him the stories were kind of fudging, fibbing, or whatever? Well, of course they did. We all do. There's stories. But there's still some underlying truth in there that we need to tease out, pull out, and look at. And so that's what's really neat about the whole thing, is that, of course, they play tricks. That's the only way to do is play tricks and have a good laugh. You know, I mean, that's part of, that's, that's, what, that's what we as na Native people do. We like to laugh and have a good time. Um, I have another perspective on that, too, because we were studying this at the same time on Mooney. And one thing you can look at in the stories in the Mooney book are the overlapping stories. You know, there are so many stories, like the Utena stories, are told by different people and told different ways. You know, if we're telling the story of the three bears to our kids at night to go to sleep, we may tell it totally different than our neighbors telling it next door, but the gist of the story is the same. Mm -hmm. So when you study the Mooney stories, whether they're different or not, that's we're learning in anthropology. That's okay, you know, in storytelling. But what you want to look for again is how many people are telling the same thing over and over and over in their own way. You know, like if they were going to tell a fairy tale, and that's how we can look at it and we can. Yes, because we'll never know what was really true. You, know, you don't know if today everything I'm telling you is really true. I'm just blowing some smoke. You know? it's, it's like you watch the news and, and, and you watch it, really? and then the news misquotes what that person just said. It's like, well, I just watched that. They didn't say that. So that happened. Of course, the, of course there was some miscommunication and some, and some direct miscommunication as well. You know, so, and uh, in my opinion, that's, how, and that's what we've learned. We did go back to school, graduate school together, and we went back to school to study Cherokees and southeastern Indians. And of everything we've learned by reading historical texts and these primary source documents, it's that 
read everything critically. You know, don't just read it like it's gospel. Yeah. And yeah, and pull out and look for those overlaps and look for things that make sense and look what jives with history. Well, don't you think there was some fearfulness too? in repeating that information and passing it on to a I wide do. person. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think yeah. about sure. their ceremonial and, 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 and Booney did pay for some for some of the transcripts he got, too, as well. He, he paid he paid them to get their books, you know, so. And he was working with the people who were left, you know, who didn't come across the well, trail. So, of course, <coughs> how scary would that be? Yeah. Really. Mm -hmm. Next so, one, please. Anyway, I always love that discussion about reading history. So, no, so here, here's, here was, I'm coming back full circle to what I started about, about, about the Cherokee, Western Cherokee, we didn't have our masks up, and it all died at the Trail of Tears. At one time, Cherokees were all over Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, okay, all at one time. Then all at one time, this whole Tennessee area, they traded this land in Tennessee for this land in Arkansas. This is Arkansas territory. These are, these are the old trailers that were from here. And went to there. It was supposed to be these right here, but these guys had jumped the gun and took the money, and they went on to there. That was the first trail of tears. That was in 1819. Don't That's what you have some relatives that did that? Yeah, I got some relatives that did that. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and the same thing that happened to the Ridge Party whenever this one happened happened to the same people here, except it was so early and so far back that nobody wrote it down. They just they just did the dirty deed and they got rid of them. But they were there. They were in Arkansas for 10 years. Why were they in Arkansas? So they could fight the Osages by proxy. It was a proxy war with the Osage. And they gave us guns when the Osage didn't. So we, we outgunned them and we killed a whole bunch of Osage. There's a lot of battles because this is Osage country right here. This is before this Indian territory was going on right here. You were hired by the federal government. Yeah. To do that. So, so. Are you this talking about the old settlers? Old settlers, yes. Okay. The old settlers came from Tennessee, went to here. Okay. And then the, the remainder in 1839, the, the infamous Trail of Tears was everybody else except for this spot right here, Eastern Turkey, all of them went to here and out in there. So this is all Turkey land. This right here was given to these guys first, right here, and then they gave it to the other removal guys on top of it. That's why we still have this battle right now going on with Cherokee. He's like, which one came first? Which one came last? Who's got the documents? Who does it? Who cares? But we're here. But the point is... The but the point is... The lawyers do that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The point is is for, you to, for somebody to say that we didn't do any kind of mass thing of any, any type after the Trail of Tears here in Northeast Oklahoma, but they're still doing it in this one little hot spot right there in Cherokee. So whenever 95, I'd say at least 95% of the Cherokees were here, right? At the removal of 1839, 1819, both, those sailors, they were here. So you can't tell me there wouldn't be a few hot spots with mass making, masking culture going on at one time or another. So Just like the stomp dances. You know, right. we used to think that there was only one, really. And now we're learning there were there how many? Dozens. There's dozens of stomp dances. He has an old man. And it's all from Hastings Shade, just sitting around talking with him. So that, that's my point, is that the Trail of Tears is not the end of the, the culture and everything. It's like so can you tell what point he's trying to make there? Because it's driving me crazy, I want to say it. So the point is <laughs> that you have this huge group of people, and they all move they're all removed or moved, like they would forget everything. And that there would only be this little tiny pinpoint group left that still remembered everything. And of course that makes sense. But some historians will argue that just because of this Just because it's written it's And because about there it. was no book written to it, or no, no research done here at that time. So I hope that made sense, the point of what was going on in Wounded Me, and why this same anthropologist didn't write about us, and what was going on with us. So he came here to do the same thing, but he couldn't so do Roger it. So Roger really has a, a burr under his saddle about somebody telling him that maps aren't, aren't Western Cherokee also. Oh, so that that's part of our off culture and everything. So yeah, I just, yeah, but that's it right there. Any questions at all? Or anything? That's the whole thing? That's it, yeah. Oh, that was great. <laughs> Well, there is there is no evidence no in in the west or the east. Mm -hmm. west A lot of times, east, you, you know, what, what I understand from what I'm reading so far is that they would like 
decide to have a, ma a mask dance in the wintertime, and so they'd get everybody that together that would dance and be the maskers, and had the mask that would show up and do it. And so... After I talk about this, I'm going to call Jared there, so get ready, Jared. So, um, <coughs> like, this mask was made by Clarence Downey, and he is now deceased. He's a national treasure, but he made a lot of masks. He made a lot of sculptures. And this was given to us by Laureen Drywater because she didn't like it because it scared her when she walked out on the front porch because it is scary at night. <laughs> So she kept it in her chicken coop. So I thought I had to do that. Roger, I got something for you because she went out and got it for him. <laughs> so anyway, we know this is the evidence. And there are some mellow bug um, masks that are still around. And people have them in their homes. And talking to people who are talking about their grandparents had a mask or had a basket. We're always talking about baskets too. That's the only real evidence we have. I know we live on Twist Mountain now. <coughs> we, we moved. Um, I'm from Stillwell. But when we got married, we moved up to Twist Mountain. It's around Piney. And Jared, that's his, it's his uh, home family allotment land, Twist family. And if you don't mind, I was told that it was called Booger Mountain. That's true. Would you like to expound on that? The reason why it's called Booger Mountain, uh, it was my grandpa's, grandpa's mom's family. They used to do booger dances up there. That's what they say anyway. But that's what and we that's have to go we by. That's what we have to go by. It's, it's like when your grandpa and grandma tell you this is what their grandma and grandpa did. Uh, we, we don't say, well, go prove it in that book right there. And then you don't, <laughs> yeah. you know, you don't we'll tell them to do like that. that. You know? yeah. it's, uh, oh, it wasn't written down. Well, I'm, you probably I just lived through the thing. But that, the mask is a pretty neat stuff to do. But anybody any questions or anything, I'd be glad to answer. Where are your masks displayed? Or where do you keep them? Or do you yeah. have a gallery of them? Or I, I'd make a... Um, Go to CherokeeBooger.com. Yeah. You know, CherokeeBooger.com yeah, altogether. Yeah. And you can find anything about him. And That's an old website, too. Sometimes he has them in the stores, and I mean, in the shops, but most yeah. of the time, people I, I ask him to make them. I haven't made any in about six months. I've been itching. I told her I need to go outside and start carving. <laughs> I've been itching to carve. Just getting ready to make some big ones yeah, on the Yeah. I got my arms blown out, and so I got to get some. Show him your scar. Yeah, I don't know, see right there. There's right there, right there. I'll get this other one worked on here pretty soon, but I, it, stuff don't stay in my hands. Your retirement plan. Yes, yes. Okay. It's from getting. This one? From it's from being Gosh, in car wreck. What is this? It's a lightwood. That, no, that's a. This is. I wouldn't say this is oak. Look how grainy it is. Oh, feels like to me. Any kind of wood? Okay. Any kind of wood. Not anything. You, Cherokees will make anything. We'll make anything to sell. So. Any uh, not really. It's just your process of going out and what you're going to use it for. Like if you're going to use it to do a certain thing, and yeah, it's like that. Like this <laughs> mask and this other booger mask, like these right here. These have these have been danced with, so I don't sell them. Once I dance with them, I give them away because uh, I don't I don't believe in using them for well, dancing and selling. <laughs> 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 This, this one has bird poop on it right here, so yeah, so this this is one of my favorite ones. This is this is one I made making fun of my son, wasn't it? He will, be, yeah, yeah. yeah so. he, we had puberty masks for both sons. We made way more, but we still won't let him have them. Yeah. But you have a question? Yes. Have you ever compared this to other indigenous peoples? A lot of indigenous mm -hmm. cultures. Oh yeah, uh, what was that? Uh, the way of the mass. I can't remember the guy's that's name. That's the, way the way of the mass. mass. That's a good one. It, they analyzed the Northwestern uh, it's Indians. Claude Levi Strauss. Le was Levi Strauss? Oh, oh, Levi Strauss. Of course. Um, yeah. I've been studying them at either. But I told him to say that. I told him to talk about all cultures have masks because yeah. we learned that we learned that in grad school. That's why I said it there. All cultures have a mask to introduce you. There's a lot of semblance between different cultures. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, you put a mask on, you get to be a different thing. You get yeah. to be a different, you're not, you can have fun and play with it and, and become somebody else. Just like Halloween. You know, it's the same thing. Same That's concept. what we compare booger dances to when we talk to young, young students and stuff about it. It's a lot like Halloween. You can put it on and become <coughs> You can put it, put it on and become. But since you're an adult audience, you need to know that they're mostly to make fun of people. They're horrible. Some of them were so racist from way back when, and some of them, they made fun of every race. Yeah. Uh, they made fun of women, made fun of old people, mm -hmm. made fun of... <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they were making fun of the baby or not, we just know they had that uh, I was going to tell them what we were doing. Oh, 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, gra or gravity. <laughs> It'd be gravity too, you know, but but yeah. yeah. So since we are an adult audience, mm -hmm. and it's me. The stories that they tell about the actual dances that were recorded and in a different place, don't they? Well, what was done some two accounts written about this being witnessed by outsiders, by non Indians. The men would take these and they would put these on to tease the women. And the way what you do is you'd have a gourd with water in it and then splash uh -huh. it on people and stuff like that. So you're like getting away like a squirt gun and stuff. Yeah. But then the role of it is is for the woman to play straight and to say, no, that's not how we act. No, that's not how we act. So their whole role, point of the booger is to come in and act terrible, have no manners, exactly. Everything that we don't want our children or anything. Yeah. And so the women, we get to take sticks and beat them. <laughs> uh huh. Buffalo. Yeah. Buffalo is my favorite hair to use. It's the big bushy tops are really great to play with. And, and this is this is Bloodroot dye. It was real bright orange. And so this is this is about a no glue. Was about a 15 year old mask. Yeah. This one and these two, they've been on tour all over the southeast. They've been in two different museums for the past two years, I guess. So uh, that's, that's where these guys have been. So they're going back in our house until they go out again. Those are wild turkey feathers. Turkey? Those are the wing feathers. Excuse me? Are those the pin feathers or what do you call them, the tufts and feathers? This is, this is buffalo hair right here. This is, this is buffalo hair here. here oh, yeah, it's kind of cool. No, uh-uh. It turns out it's the, my favorite is we use Gordon. What they're doing in Cherokee now is some of them are putting elastic strap around the gourd ones, and then you can really get some good head movements when you have to worry about it and stuff. But otherwise, if you have a big old bushy hair like me, it just kind of stays on. You tie it to the hair, and it's, it's not moving. Well, let me ask you, is that, is that one piece or is that nose attached? The nose is attached. Sure See, I, what's, way, way I, I do my mask is the same well, way they maybe do. Maybe the gourd grew that way. No, uh -huh. that'd be too cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot, a lot, with this is, if you can see the gourd, it's like, this is the half of it right here, and here's coming up, and here's, more than likely they had a bigger one like this came off and went like that. So if you, you can see this, this is half a gourd right here. And then that I attach it like that. To pull it out and make them look really human. You grow the gourds yourself? No, I don't make my car drive either, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, I'm sorry. But <laughs> 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 I can't. I can't. I can't grow a thing. I can't. I've, how many years have I tried? You can grow river cane, cochani, and rattlesnake. Matter. If it's already out there in the woods, I can dig it up and move it. Yeah, but if I have to take care of it, you have to buy your doors. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to go to Texas and buy them, except that we got pulled over the last few times for having Indian tag, and they said they're going. To, yeah, so, I order my I order my gourds out of California now. Well born or good. get them at Baird's. Or Baird. Baird's has the best noses. I use the Baird's for my noses. But, but the good thick gourds like this come from California. What is it? It's a fruit orchard. Family. 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 Yeah. Family. Yeah. They grow gourds. Oh, they're all still with you. Yeah, I've done that. That's very important. I got some skull ones and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So any other questions or anything? Anything? I think you can. You, you know, you really learn a lot from cultures. I spent a lot of time in Central America, and most of their masks are kind of like the Buddha mask because it's a lot of fun. It's really, and it's not the warrior kind of stuff, but it's um, mostly making fun of everything. Everything, yeah. And that's that's what you want to do when you get a group like this. You know, you want to have a good time. And, and I might add, whenever they did that, they weren't drunk. When they were doing these burger masks, they were all sober. You know, the alcohol you could do your alcohol somewhere else. That's what's cool about Cherokee ceremony. You do your, your Cherokee gatherings. You do your drinking somewhere else. We're all gathering as Cherokees, so we're not going to drink. And another here. thing I like to say besides the drink thing is, we have had a, a few individuals say it's a dirty dance. It's not a dirty dance. Oh. It's a dance about how to behave. But we're still using the phallic image sometimes, but we don't necessarily tell children that's what it is. Some people see it, some people don't. But there, there's nothing dirty done in the way that Roger has some students now that are doing it. It's probably time to go. Roger has students that are doing it right now with him and taking classes, and they're learning to make them, and they're going to be masking and, and mm -hmm. dancing and singing. Mm -hmm. right. And that's it's what he's so teaching classic. is the value of the dance, what it really means. And, of course, 
If you're voting for Trump, don't get mad. But there was one young man who picked Trump because he was Twitter mask, mm -hmm. and it was hilarious. And it was much better fun. <laughs> Whether you're for him or not, you made a great booger. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We had pictures, yeah. but we didn't put them just for you, babe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's more hands. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Jason made a Trump mask and danced with them over at Bay Hill. Yeah, that was fun. He had a big old sign, vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had many yeah. signs, too. Very cute. Yeah. Well, I just appreciate y'all coming out, listening to me jabber and talk, and Sean, control my little buttons there. We are a matrix.